tenants. Did you want to add? To yeah, that, Steve? I mean, so I, I mean, I think what Gordon says is absolutely right. But one needs to understand that on the British side, I mean, we all know about the protests against the Stamp Act in North America. On the British side, there were massive protests against the Stamp Act as well. Um, and uh, uh, there were riots, uh, uh, there were riots, um, I mean, I, I have a sort of map that shows you, I mean, there were, there were actually 67 different localities that had some sort of, uh, in England itself, just England alone, that had uh, a protests of various forms against, against the Stamp Act. There, were, uh, there was obviously wide circulation of pamphlets, there was criticism of the Stamp Act in newspapers as well, um, and ultimately, uh, Grenville's government falls because, because of the Stamp Act. Now, the the problem on the British side is that there were two different arguments against the Stamp Act that were, uh, that were incompatible on constitutional grounds. So the position of the Rockingamite Whigs uh, associated with Edmund Burke was precisely um, uh, as Gordon says. There's nothing wrong constitutionally, according to Burke. Um, and the Rocky Mites with the Stamp Act. It was simply imprudent. It was bad economics. It hit the, it hit the Americans in a way that was bad for Britain. It was going to hurt imports. It was going to hurt, uh, hurt exports, hurt, uh, 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 hurt the, the British economy, the imperial economy. That was the Rocking Mite argument. There was another argument associated with William Pitt and his groups. And it was, I mean, uh, it was very heavily elaborated um, in a series of pamphlets that get circulated. And the key thinker along William Pitt, uh, on William Pitt's side was a man by the name of Joseph Massey. Uh, Massey was a very learned, very sophisticated political economic thinker. In fact, he was deeply influential uh, for the later thinking of Adam Smith. What Massey says is, uh, Burke completely misunderstands the nature of representation. It's not about virtual representation. It's about the representation of economic interests. So in fact, we need to reform the entire body of representation in the imperial parliament. It's not okay that Manchester doesn't have representation. It's not okay that this most, you know, this uh, booming manufacturing town doesn't have representation in parliament. It's not okay uh, that Old Sarum, with its five voters, uh, uh, gets two MPs. Um, that's wrong. It's also wrong that North America doesn't have any representation, Jamaica doesn't have any representation, um, and what we need to do is to it's uh, what we need to do is reform the Constitution in a but, radical but Steve, way. Steve, doesn't that that doesn't really uh, take? I mean, in fact, that take place till 1830s, right? It doesn't it, actually happen, but it, but it is the position, oh, position, of course. But, but it is the pit. It's why it's important to understand why the opponents of Grenville can't agree. So there's a powerful opposition to, to Grenville, and Grenville's government falls, but there are two different arguments. One is that it was imprudent, and right, one is that right. it was fundamentally unconstitu unconstitutional. And that's why there's, there's a sort of incoherence on the British political side. Well, and, and of course, accompanying these protests that the colonists uh, did against the Stamp Act are, are non-importation agreements, which are the beginnings in American history, at least, of what we now come to call uh, economic sanctions, if you think about it. it go, there's a direct line from the non-importation agreements of the 1760s uh, to the uh, Jefferson's embargo of 1807, all the way to the economic sanctions w which we are now imposing on, on, uh, on Iran. So uh, th these economic sanctions did have an effect on oh, British, yeah. although, uh, that, and, the, and, and, and Steve's right, um, Grenville Falls, and uh, the Rockingham Whigs take, play, uh, take over for a year, and they do one big thing. They, they do away with the Stamp Act, but they accompany, it, accompany that repeal, which is very difficult for the House of Commons to do, Parliament. We have to understand how important Parliament is in English consciousness. For them to take back what they've just done is very, very difficult. They call in Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, as a, 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 to testify, and he become, because he's the most famous American that they know of, and he, uh, he advises them, you've got to get rid of this Stamp Act, even though he himself had not been all that upset by it. Uh, and so they repeal it, but they pass the Declaratory Act, which says, we, the Parliament, don't, I'll, I'll translate it into modern yeah. don't get any ideas by our repeal that we don't have the right to do it. We have the right to do anything, essentially. All aspects whatsoever are under, the, under Parliament's sovereignty. Well, that issue eventually emerges uh, by the late um, 
six, there's an important pamphlet written by uh, one of these sub-ministers, uh, uh, William Knox, yeah. where he lays it out in uh, graphic terms. He says, if you accept Parliament's authority in one little aspect, you have to accept it in all aspects because of this doctrine of sovereignty, which William Blackstone made famous in his, famous in his commentaries on the law. But if you deny, Knox says, if you deny Parliament's authority in one iota, then you have to deny it all. You have to, you, you're totally independent of Parliament. Well, the assumption being that if you give the colonists that kind of choice, well, of course, no right-thinking, liberal-thinking Englishman would ever want to be out from Parliament's authority because Parliament is the bulwark of their liberties. And that is something the colonists never quite appreciate. For Englishmen, and this goes back to, to what Steve knows best, uh, which is the uh, Glorious Revolution, that Parliament is the source and protector of English liberty, and no good Whig would ever doubt that. And the colonists aren't quite so sure about that. And when they're given that choice, and, and Thomas Hutchinson uh, following Knox, not because he read Knox, but because it's part of the climate, in, in, in January of 1773, he is the last civilian governor of the colony of Massachusetts. He goes before the general court and says the same thing Knox did. He says, you either accept Parliament's authority in all matters, or, or if you deny Parliament's authority in one, one measure, you have to, you're going to be totally independent. Well, Samuel Adams and John Adams give a response from the House of Representatives. If that's our choice, then we're totally independent <laughs> of Parliament. Now keep that in mind because in the next year, 1774, there are a series of pamphlets written by all of those that we consider the major founders and some secondary founders. John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, Franklin, uh, James Wilson, Thomas Jefferson, all come to the conclusion that the colonies are not under Parliament's authority at all. They're tied solely to the king. Now this is called, has been called by historians a commonwealth theory of the empire because it anticipates the Statute of Westminster of 1931, which is essentially how the British Commonwealth operates. As you know, the legislatures of Australia and Canada and New Zealand are all uh, free of, of they, uh, they don't have to kowtow to Parliament, uh, but they do have a common tie with the Queen, with the monarch. And that's what the colonists' position was that the, the position they had reached by 1774. I think not, not because they had anticipated this, they're forced into it intellectually by this formidable argument that there must be in every state one final supreme uh, lawmaking authority. And that, the British keep throwing that in their faces and they finally say, they, they keep trying to divide it. Oh no, we, we, we'll agree to some authority of parliament as in trade matters, but not in others. And they keep, the Brits keep coming back saying, no, you can't have it. It's not divisible. It has to be, sovereignty is indivisible. And they're stuck with that, and they're forced into this position of denying Parliament's authority entirely.